talk to us about why that is such a pressing issue currently, why this is kind of like the, the warning lights flashing on the dashboard of our collective financial car telling us that something is very, very wrong and urgently uh, going to impact us? Well, um, the first thing is just what we've been talking about, and that is um, uh, what is clear to me, and I think will be increasingly clear to people in the markets, that interest rates are going to rise a lot further than are currently discounted in the markets. That's the first thing. And then we had this situation where um, governments, or rather the central banks, have been expanding the quantity of um, money and credit in circulation. Um, like drunken sailors. I mean, they really, it's just incredible. Like, okay, you've got an, you've always got an excuse, you know, COVID, whatever. There's always a very good excuse to try and stimulate the economy and to stop it collapsing and all the rest. We had COVID, we've had supply chain um, dislocations and, uh, and that's ongoing, by the way. China um, in Shanghai, 500 ships queuing to get in. Um, this is absolutely impossible. Um, I mean, that's going to continue on through most of this year because of the knock-on effects, knock-on effects, knock-on effects. And then in the middle of this, uh, Russia walked in to try and take over the Ukraine. And the West responds by saying, you can't do that. We will sanction you. Now, hold on a minute. They're sanctioning the world's largest supplier, exporters of commodities the largest in the world, bar none. And those commodities are principally energy uh, and various other really important commodities. And not only that, but you've got little sort of niches like uh, the, the Ukraine um, produces, uh, I think, about half the world's neon or something, um, some, something extraordinary. So the effect in terms of um, uh, producing semiconductors uh, is is actually going to be really quite, quite uh, catastrophic. And uh, there is an even worse problem with that, which of course the politicians will not take the blame for. And that is the amount of starvation that is going to occur around the world as a result of um, our actions against Russia and, uh, you know, in connection with the Ukraine, because the Ukraine and Russia in the steppes are the largest exporters of grains we have. Um, the Chinese have already cornered the market on existing stocks, like they've got something like 70% of uh, the world's uh, maize, 70% of the world's wheat, got something like oh, close to that with rice. Um, they've got about 30, 35% of the world's uh, soybean stocks for 20% of the world's population, which means that the rest of us get to go whistle. Um, and if that's not bad enough, you've got another problem coming up, and that is that um, the cost of fertilizer is just going to go through the roof because it's energy intensive. And not only that, but one of the big exporters of fertilizers is, guess who? The Ukraine. So you can see that um, this is a story which is going to get a lot worse over the course of this year. And I fully expect to see people starve in uh, particular particularly the poorer nations um, in the middle of this year, later on this year. Uh, and uh, food prices for the rest of us are going to be way high. You're going to have food banks and all the rest of it. I mean, the demand from um, uh, families is going to be, I think, really, um, you know, it, it will be really upsetting to watch. It really will. We've got this ahead of us. And um, it was all preventable in a sense. I mean, if they hadn't printed the money in the first place, and if they had actually uh, responded to the Russian invasion of the Ukraine or the attempt to uh, in, in invade Ukraine um, uh, differently, uh, then the situation wouldn't have been nearly so bad. So this is, this is um, a, ra a very unpleasant thing which is about to happen to us or is in the process of happening, happening to us. I don't think we've seen the end of the price of oil rising. And the thing to bear in mind to understand what's actually happening to commodity prices is it's not so much commodity prices rising, but it's the purchasing power of the currencies that we measure them in falling. Now, there are about a half a dozen of the 25 or so questions that were submitted ahead of your arrival here that deal with this particular point. And you've already touched on it in two regards. You've talked about the Bank of Japan and others who are keeping rates like 
pegged close to zero or, or negative even. And then you've also talked about that the natural uh, force or effect will be on increasing uh, interest rates. People are trying to understand how does that how does that collision get resolved? DG says, why will interest rates hit 5 to 10%? Alistair has mentioned this before, but what will actually drive this in detail? Will they not just force interest rates lower as usual, or will this not work, and why? Well, I think we've got a very good example of this with the Bank of Japan's uh, monetary policy at the moment. The Bank of Japan is just sticking to its Keynesian stimulant, stimulant, stimulating <laughs> monetary policy. Um, and uh, um, the result is that the yen is collapsing. You know, I mean, to, the relationship between interest rates uh, and the purchasing power of the currency is indirect. It's indirect in that you've got to look at it from the saver's point of view. With a fiat currency, the saver is looking at three things. First of all, there is the time preference. In other words, the amount of money that, the amount of time rather, that he has lost use of the money. That's the first thing. There is the risk involved in who the saver is lending his savings to. That's the second thing. And the third thing, which doesn't occur with uh, a proper gold-backed currency, but happens with a fiat currency, is the saver's um, expectation of the purchasing power of that currency when it is returned to him at the end of the loan. Now, that is now suddenly rearing its ugly head. And what this means is that markets will cease to function unless interest rates actually respond to what the savers um, demand in terms of compensation for the loss of purchasing power. And um, most of the most of your uh, followers, I think, are likely to be too young to remember this, but some of them will. Um, if you go back to 1980 and 1981, Paul Volcker raised the um, Fed funds rate to, I think, 19.2, 19.3%, which meant prime rates were over 20%. And what he was saying, in, in effect, to um, people with dollars was, you know, look, I'm offering you 20% uh, for you to deposit your money. Now, you know, make up your mind. Do you want, I mean, do you want to get rid of it or do you want to make 20%? And that was basically what he was saying. And he raised the, 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 the Fed funds rate above the general market expectation of how the purchasing power of the dollar was likely to change, say, in, the, in a year's time. Things were bearish at that time. And I think that um, expectations in terms of interest rates, probably in the region of um, you know, a proper rate to discount would probably be in the region of, say, 15 percent, 12, 15 percent. So a 20 percent hike was really, oh, you know, you've you got to go for it. And it was that that stopped the movement of savers out of dollars 